Well, welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill. Um, have a really great discussion for you today. We're going to be talking with uh, Talia. That's the one thing I didn't ask before we started. Uh, Talia Lugasi? Lugasi. Lugasi. Talia Lugasi. Okay. Um, and she is the director and co-writer of This Is Not a War Story, a film that uh, was just recently released that... Um, it, it, it's a very unusual, but powerful film. It uh, tracks a ragtag group of combat veterans in New York whose anti-war art, poetry, and papermaking keeps them together despite the specter of their friend's suicide and the ever-crystallizing fact that healing from war is sometimes an impossible mission. So uh, with us today... Um, is uh, the director Talia? Talia, how are you? Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm well, thanks, Henry. You know, hanging in there through pandemic times. It's like everybody is just <laughs> at hanging on the wire. Um, so yeah. Talia uh, co-wrote and directed the feature film *Descent*, starring mm -hmm. Rosario Dawson, which premiered in competition at the Tribeca Film Festival, and was released theatrically by Warner Independent, despite an NC-17 rating. *Descent* was championed by the New York Times as, quote, essential to see a vividness never seen in American film, end quote. Talia is a full-time assistant professor of screen studies at Eugene, Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts, the new school in New York City. She is also a member of the Actors Studio Playwrights and Directors Union and began studying filmmaking at NYU uh, Tisch at the age of 15. She's directed numerous short films, as well as directed environmental PSAs with Frack Action, Water Defense, Mark Ruffalo, and Food and Water Watch. So, um, Talia, will you please uh, share with the listeners uh, a little bit about yourself and your uh, background as a filmmaker? Um, sure. Um, I, I got into film... Uh, Pretty early on, I was basically just obsessed with film from the time I was 12 years old and, um, you know, just kind of went from one director to another pretty obsessively, Oliver Stone movies, Stanley Kubrick movies and the rest. And um, so I knew pretty early on that I wanted to make films and I, I, I kind of uh, was gunning for NYU film school at an early age. So I, I figured out how to graduate high school a year early and then I, I got into NYU early and then I got out of that early. Um, I worked on everything in the city that I could possibly work on. I, I would basically walk up to a film set and lie about my age and my experience and get hired and, and, and learn, learn stuff and was making my own short films um, at that time. So yeah, I mean, I, I basically just am kind of, I'm kind of self-taught and just come from a, a, a real love of, of a certain kind of filmmaking, I guess, and I'm still pursuing that kind of, kind of um, stubbornly um you know trying to trying to kind of you know make films that 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 i believe matter and will stand the test of time that's my hope um, in any case um but yeah that's that's sort of my background and... if you were to um were there any specific films that you really saw as kind of the them thematic origins of this? Were there any, any things that you could point our listeners to that kind of gave you an idea? Um, film wise, no, this really came from personal life. Um, you know, I've, I've been sort of contending with trauma my whole adult life. And, um, and it comes from a childhood that I, you know, I've, I've spent a lifetime trying to get a grip on. So, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it, this film is is definitely there's a lot of film sources for this but it wasn't so much the content inspiration um like i would point to the films of Bresson on to say that this is where i got you know ideas about actors and non-actors in the same movie and how does that work and you know how far can you take that um but but the but content wise they're not very related at all um yeah i i i definitely grew up with a fascination towards um military culture um, I don't have any, I actually, I do have a, an uncle who's a Vietnam vet, but I never got to know him very well. And he died when I was a teenager. Um, but on my father's side of the family, 
um, I, he, he's, uh, my father is Moroccan and came to this country in the 70s. His family all lives in Israel, so I spent a lot of time um, as a kid um, in Israel, and I, I didn't obviously know anything about the politics at that time. But I, I knew that all my cousins and uncles and aunts had all been in the, in the IDF, and I, I did sort of worship that, and I, I had a very early kind of uh, desire to, to be in that. And, and it was the one sort of identity that I felt over time as I was dealing with trauma was the one thing that I could kind of cling to to sort of help me survive. Um, so there's a lot, I guess, more personally going on with this than, 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 uh, uh, than uh, cinematically in terms of uh, references. Yeah. Um, so uh, bring us into, uh, this is not a war story. What, uh, what is what is the film about, and um, what was the experience like for you uh, making it, both as the director and as the actor? Cool. Yeah. I mean, well, the film to me is is about trying to figure out how to live with trauma. Um, I I definitely uh, I haven't seen, and also this was something I found in the veteran community when I got to know people there. That they had also never really seen movies that depicted trauma that realistically assessed the fact that like you fucking live with it your whole life it isn't something that like by the end of the movie you're fine <laughs> like yeah. it's it's never been my experience with it and when i learned how to live with it one of my realizations was it, it ain't going anywhere you can learn to live with it you can show up every day and do the things but you, you're not going to you know it, you can't expel it from yourself so so in, in a way, the movie was, was an attempt to, to portray trauma in, through that lens, which I felt like I had never seen before in a film. Um, and then also, as far as the experience making the movie, it was, it was absolutely life altering for me because I was, I was pulling on these threads that I wasn't really sure that I had the right to tell the story, that I, that I really belonged here, that I could do any of these things. And, and, and slowly but surely, the more uh, veterans that I got to know as I was building this this narrative it became clear that I had such a kinship and and it was and what I was learning from them through the process of making the film was how they've figured out how to cope and how their you know humor and their and their tactile art you know with with the paper making and whatnot were, were was it was a way to on the daily you know um, contend with the demons and sort this shit out. So it was, it was, it was really the first time I had actually discovered a community of people that I liked being around. I'm kind of a solitary type person, and I, I always wondered if there was a, you know, group of human beings somewhere that I might relate to, and and I seem to have found them. So it was, you know, the process of making the film was definitely quite a challenge um, uh, from start to finish. No doubt. Um. Something I want to return to a little bit later, but I just wanted to key up on it with what you what you just said that the we we deal with so many films and stories these days that um, one what you just what you said about that trauma is easily done away that you know it's like a course of antibiotics I, I dealt with it it's gone now I don't have to carry it anymore is yeah every day you you know and and people need to understand that that it's it's something that it's like luggage is that it's you you bring it with you and sometimes it's heavier sometimes it's lighter but it's always there but the other one and I think the a little bit more powerful one is the idea that veterans are special that my trauma is not something that non-military people can experience and if they could it's still worse and 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 just that that continual dismissal of other people's traumatic experiences because they don't have the the title veteran um yeah i i want to i want to yeah. come back to that a little bit later but i just wanted to to mention that i thought that was a yeah a very powerful choice on your part and those aren't certainly the only tropes about veterans about the military that you um you mm -hmm. push in this film but the, we'll, we'll get get to that a little bit too talk uh, talk with listeners a little bit about the production process that the as opposed to having a i would imagine ordinarily truncated movie filming schedule you broke it down into a whole bunch of little sections and let you yourself go through it you know a bit at a time that's good that's bad and then move on to the next thing please tell, tell the listeners a little bit about that yeah, we had a very unusual um, shooting schedule arrangement, which I, I had conceived of well in advance. And so that everybody, all my key players were on board with this um, 
crazy idea, but but sensible in this in the in the in because of what we had to undergo. So the idea was to keep the crew as small as possible. Um, kind of vet everybody so that I knew that there wasn't going to be one person who was going to kind of upset the balance of the of the flow of energy sure. among the all of us. Um, and then basically divide the film into sections whereby we had at least two or three weeks, sometimes more, to to stop everything and reflect. And I could look at the footage if I needed to and make any changes that I needed to make. Um, and what this enabled me to do was to never have to do what's called playback on set. Playback is when you shoot something and then you immediately go behind the camera and you press play and you watch it back. It eats up a ton of time. It totally interrupts the flow. And because I'm acting in the damn thing, I would have to then watch myself and then jump back. It would be impossible. So like I had to figure out a way. Yeah, it would, it, it just, it was just, it's too much mind fuckery. And, and so I, I, I thought this is also helpful, not just in that sense, but also because I'm doing something that is unconventional in the sense that we have a script and we know where the improvisational pieces are going to be, but we don't necessarily know how they're going to go. Sure. Um, so I don't know how much I can rely on that. There was a version of the movie in my head where we didn't really use any of it because I didn't, you know, I, I, I knew and I hoped and I test, I did a bunch of test shoots and all these kinds of things, but you never quite know. Um, so this, I, I, I guess just from my experience making films in the past, the one thing I, I valued more than anything else was time. And, and the more time you have, to to process what you're doing and and stop and reflect and and look and change if you need to the the better the film is bound to be um the the the, the way you end up fucking up so much when you make a film is because you're in such a goddamn rush um it's it's and it's so hard not to be in a rush when you're when you're making a film it's just there's always a million things um that you have to pay attention to and surprises on top of that and so i thought if i can just build in time um, we'll, we'll be able to do what we're trying to do here, you know, with, with sensitivity that the, the, the level of sensitivity that, that we needed to, you know. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's, there's, uh, there's so much mistrust that can come from trauma and especially when certain, you know, certain buttons, certain things are pushed. Um, something that, this film did that I, I don't think I've ever seen done in a similar way um, is in addition to the personal trauma and the the military trauma there is the familial trauma there is the you know the separation from family members who maybe didn't want us to join or they did but they they didn't like what we did or their own personal reasons for you know why they're choosing that and that and that becomes an additional layer you know if 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 you have people at home that you trust and by home i mean you know extended family certainly too it it gives you a buffer it gives you protection um you know my uh my relationship with my wife has been something that's been very very healing for me because she and i have established that good kind of trust um can you talk a little bit about the film's exploration of, of family issues and how, how you approach that. Yeah, absolutely. It was a huge, huge part of the movie. Um, it was very important to me to reflect the fact that, you know, the impulse to do something like, like go into the military often happens because you, you don't have that kind of uh, support system that you come from or that kind of clarity with relationships or, you know, and I, I was really interested in the connections of that because, because of my own experience and the, poor choices that I've made or large, you know, often because I, I don't really come from that uh, either. And, and um, so it was important for me to have these, these family relationships in the film, but I also didn't want to be too overly descriptive about them because I, I wanted to, I wanted it to be present, um, but I didn't want it to kind of take over the narrative um, in the sense that you understood too much informationally about what had happened. I thought it was enough that there was the implication there that the family was, was disconnected and fragmented, um, and, and that that, you know, led to certain choices, um, and, and, and of course the inability to trust, and the whole relationship between the Isabel and Will characters is, is about this, can we even trust each other thing, and, and all of the tenuous um, scenes that go on between them, that's really what's at the heart of, of all of those. And, and so they were 
you know, in terms of the writing process, that was the most sort of, you know, personal aspect of it for me was just that navigating the, the, the trust there and, and, I, um, yeah, and, and, and what comes out of that. And they, they seem to, to find something between each other that's the beginning of something, you know, which is, which is you know, good. <laughs> it's healthy. Absolutely. Sorry, I hit mute there for a second. Um, I'll remember. Hold on one second. Um, oh, um, the I, I really did like those lighter touches with the, the relationships outside of the veterans that it was the story very much centered on them, but allowed that family presence to be there. And also is that, you know, it's not it's not um, it's not always pretty, you know, your 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 brother's character in the Isabel's uh, brother in the movie seems to be very supportive or as supportive as he can be, you know, but he he absolutely cares for his sister, wants to be there for her, didn't seem to take the broken nose quite too personally. Um, but but he's definitely there. And, and you can see that, you know, he he does seem to understand where your lack of trust comes from, and especially the relationship with with mom, you know, is that that the it, it, it's, you know, an entirely reversed uh, with the with the brother. And that's something, you know, like I, I mentioned with my wife is that the the those those areas of distrust get compounded when you add in trauma it becomes that much more and and going to thanksgiving dinner is not nearly as simple anymore um and it, it really can can have a have a a significant impact on your life but i i thought it was great that it was you know that that it was it was centered on the veterans but you you understood where the family was where other people and by and by family i'm not just meaning family family um, you know, Will's, Will's co-workers um, at the, the counseling center seem very, you know, very in tune with him. You know, he knows their fellow veterans and have, have somewhat of an understanding of, of what he went through. So, you know, the family, you know, it, it definitely extends to those good friends, those good co-workers. Um, you know, I consider them in, in my family bubble as well. Um, so let's talk about um, some of the tropes that, that, uh, that you did away with in this film. You have um, Will is played by uh, Sam. I can't remember how to pronounce his last name. Adagoge. Um, yeah. Will is played by Sam Adagoge um, as the lead protagonist. And it's centered on his story, on the experiences of somebody who's a person of color, who's, who's black and had to survive whatever it was that happened to him. Um, not only just in the the trauma, potential trauma of being in the military, but of being a black man, being a woman, um, you know, all the, all those kind of things. Um, and then uh, m actually moving on to that next part is that you have a, a female veteran as as number two, you know, the next the next uh, most center person in the story, played by yourself. And uh, it really it really throws away a lot of the of the ordinary tropes that we're so used to you know your 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 character uh, Isabel wasn't defined by being a victim of sexual assault uh, she wasn't defined as being a subject of pursuit by other men in the film um, and that includes not just will but the other veterans that you meet while everybody's uh, making paper that there's a uh, um, an acceptance there um, that uh, Isabel and Sam's relationship, you know, it's not defined by sex. It's not defined by romance. It's not defined um, by any of those ordinary things that we seem to constantly and consistently uh, saddle female characters with. And I think it's, I, I think it's awful. Um, you and I talked a little bit before we started that I, I'm, uh, I was an MP. I served six years in the army and I served with female soldiers, female soldiers that were tough as nails that, you know, we're absolutely a part of the team. And, and it was, um, it was a bit of an odd experience for me because there were times like during my second tour where our female soldiers couldn't come with us. We were going to bases out in the Al Anbar province, way out in West Iraq. And at that time, the Marines were in charge of it and none of their combat or combat support 
um, personnel were female. And so they literally wouldn't let our troops come out there. And I, I understood that decision, but I was also absolutely enraged by it, you know, and because um, in my first tour, our, our, our female comrades were with us the whole time. You know, they were there, they fought in every battle that we fought in, and they bring home the same kind of trauma that we have. Um, it's, yeah, uh, that was a huge part well, of that decision for me was was just the idea that like I, I had to if I was going to embark on this film not I didn't want this female character to be defined by those things it was sure. just enormously frustrating for me to see in films in general um, but then in terms of this experience the fact that the trauma comes from just the same exact fucking place that it comes from with other dudes it's mm -hmm. like it comes from that experience of being there and living it and and it isn't sexually related or any of those things that's all you know, you know what i mean so it was a very conscious uh, choice on, on on behalf of the story from the very beginning yeah no i i think i think it's great i i i wish that that modern stories could be more nuanced and include some of those things but they um like you mentioned about trauma is that mod modern film does a really poor job demonstrating what trauma is outside of you know montages of people downing pills or or stuck in bed and you know just those kind of things and they you know not that those things couldn't be included in the story if it helps something but that's all we usually end up seeing and um i think it's just it's it's absolutely irresponsible and ignorant of of that of, of not understanding the, the all the different facets that can affect somebody's time in the military and and then of course become compounded that they you know it's like brick, a stack of bricks that you occasionally add another brick on and have to keep carrying it um and so the last one and the one i you know i i mentioned a little bit earlier but it's it's absolutely um vital to me is that you know we we have to veterans are not special you know, we, 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 we want to really give them that special stamp and say what you went through was entirely unique. And it, it's not. It's not at all. And the sooner that we can understand that, you know, that, that veterans with, with trauma can make common cause with ordinary people who don't, I think people would have a much easier time both understanding trauma, but understanding how the military creates trauma, how that um, there's all kinds of situations that somebody can find themselves in where they're not being treated as a full-fledged person. You know, they're the person, person behind the gun or the person who drives the truck, but they're, they're not treated with that respect. Um, but I, I think that it was, it did it wonderfully. It did a, a really great job of, uh, trying to ignore those. And I wanted to ask you, um, what, what was the experience like creating trust with the other veterans that were in the story? How did you as a, both as a filmmaker, but as a person, how did you, you know, I know certainly they needed to become comfortable with you, but you as the new person, both in producing the film and the person in the film, you had to get used to them. Please uh, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that took, you know, I spent a lot of time, um, with them prior to shooting. I think it was practically two years um, of very regular contact. Um, and, you know, it started slowly, but I, I just, I was absolutely riveted by the work that they did. And then as I got to know them, I was, I, I have an immediate sense, like, I know if I'm safe or not. I know if I, you know, I, I, at this point in my life, I have a very good, I think, internal kind of check system of you know if i should leave or not or pursue this or what and and i all i felt was just like immediately they seemed so lovable to me and so understandable that i i i just i could foresee a friendship and that's just not an experience i've had with a lot of people so i but it still went very slowly and i i had the the idea that i wanted them to be in the film because there was at one point early on the idea that well i'll write these characters and you know these guys will help me kind of cast the right person and train the actors or whatever but as soon as i started hanging out with them i thought they absolutely have to be in the film there's no way i'm not doing that so i i i really just kind of it was a process of allowing myself to be okay with this new experience of I really want to trust these people I want to be around them and, and to be okay with that feeling and allow it to happen and then to 
to reciprocate and 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 allow them to get to know me a little bit and 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 be able to trust me and i and i i kind of you know that that only happens over time it's just a matter of of continuing to to show up and to have the relationships and to be honest and to be and i was very upfront about you know my interest in trauma and this where the story comes from and and just trying to do exactly what you're pointing out henry is just the, the idea that like it's this universal traumatic experience it's not confined to one um you know select group of people um and i think the more that we separate ourselves and identify in a certain way it's it's not helpful i i one thing that was very liberating about the experience was realizing that like you know i'm not i'm not crazy and i'm not alone and there are people who had totally different experiences than me in the reality of their lives but we have such a similar experience of life in this moment because of 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 these traumatic patterns so wherever the pattern may have originated um you know and it took me a lot of years and a lot of time to kind of um you know live with and deal with and understand my own trauma and traumatic patterns as a as a bodily situation you know how trauma just plays out in your body as reactions and and to contend with it on that level um but very early on like you know whatever how, thousands of years ago when i started therapy and i was learning about what in the fuck was happening for me one of my therapists basically contextualized my childhood as saying that it was okay it's ptsd but i didn't quite understand what she meant i mean i sort of did and she was like look it's as if you had been in a war and these are the things that result from that and that sentence always stuck with me because i didn't know anything about that you know and i you know so her comparison kind of it always sort of lingered in the back of my mind and i think that i it's it helped me make these connections that many 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 years later have kind of you know played out in in this experience i suppose um it's a very deep subject obviously i could talk for hours and hours about that but that's the general sort of uh, sort of picture i think i have this quote um not not so much a question but just kind of an idea for discussion here that um it's from uh tim o'brien uh the, the things they carry um quote a true war story is never moral it does not instruct nor encourage virtue nor suggest models of proper human behavior nor restrain men from doing the things men have always done if a story seems moral do not believe it if at the end of a war story you feel uplifted or if you feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste then you have been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie there is no rectitude whatsoever there is no virtue as a first rule of thumb therefore you can tell a true war story by its absolute and uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil now the the evil part although that you know uh, there was was some very good discussion and i really enjoyed the the um the awareness of the characters in terms of their political knowledge you know that that you, you don't hear about burn pits very often in movies you don't hear about accidental drone strikes um you don't hear about starving kids in yemen um you know and and the, these are very real things that go on in our world but they get pushed to the side way too easily especially in our you know veteran heavy veteran uh worship that that is kind of just a, a quintessential part of being an american um but i think that that is the the most important link and uh, that, oh that does remind me i think i remember what the question was um it was a kind of about the the space in between being a veteran and being a citizen and that this movie is the exact kind of example we need to help more people understand that that bridge that um both that it is not unique but that for those veterans that do have that their experience needs to be allowed that space allowed that 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 honesty but we have to do it from the other side too you know you're a citizen you've gone through horrible things well you've gone through horrible things you know it, it's what your instructor told you is i think i think dead on and i and we but we get so wrapped up in in our our cultural expectations of what veterans are supposed to look like and 
um, most especially egregious, something I talked with my my friend Tom Secker, who's a, a frequent guest on our podcast, is just the is the tropes is is the is the um, you know trying to to seem too much the tough guy riding horses in twelve strong while shooting their rifles, which never happened, you know, at all. But but that ends up in a movie, and those movies, you know, things like Black Hawk Down, Saving Private Ryan, they end up becoming markers for the people that see them and they're told, you know, told different things. And, you know, I was, there was never explained to me that I could come back with trauma that nobody can see, you know, trauma that I can't easily explain to my friends and family. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's, that's what they want to do is they want to like exactly what Tim just, just mentioned in that quote, um, is they, they want to give somebody uplifting, unearned uplifting feelings let's let's put it that way is it and and i've had that i've had that i remember having that for the you know majority of my life watching black hawk down you know is that it was it was horrible and it, why did they have to do that but hey they did it good job guys well they didn't have to and if they did why do we think that why do we think that they absolutely you know people have to go and and defend what we say is is the defense of our country it's really defense of the myth of our country. It's not defending the actual country. It's just, um, it's just bullshit. Is what what it is. Sorry, I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, no. Yeah, um, so, um, could you, um, um, could you, um, is there? Uh, you guys have a festival coming up this weekend. Uh, uh, Cinequest is that the yeah yeah it's called Cinequest it's out of Los Angeles but it's it's virtual um oh, this year okay. obviously and and so yeah sun this Sunday the twenty eighth um you can watch the film and then there'll be a Q and A with um myself and um Eli Wright who's a a rock veteran and and one of the actors in the film um and pl who plays himself obviously and also Sam Adegoke um our actor playing Will and uh, executive producer um. Rosario Dawson. So all four of us will be on deck for a Q and A. Should should be interesting. I mean, I'm 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 hoping that we'll we'll get into some deeper topics. But it's as a film festival Q and A. It's not going to dive as deep as you and I are are attempting to do. So sure, sure. I appreciate a conversation of this kind. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, I will. Um, I'll share that online. That that's coming up, and see if we can get a few of our our followers. I'm I'm planning to yeah. to watch it myself, and maybe I can inject a. A question or two in there that's a little maybe maybe a little different we'll have to wait and see like you said it's a it's a film festival um yeah there was a lot uh henry in what you were just describing that i would love to just sure no no go ahead about. i'm sorry i didn't yeah yeah go ahead please um just, there, there's so much in there to unpack and and you know it reminded me that one of the first you know kind of conversations that i had with the the veterans that i got to know as we were preparing to make this film was obviously we talked a lot about movies and so you know and it was interesting to me one that like so many of, of the veterans that i got to know are film buffs which i just think is hilarious and great and and it just gave us such a great point of entry and we could talk about all the movies that we hated and why we hated them and for all the reasons you're describing and i i just um you know i, I, I there was one part of what you were describing in there that that um that, that called out to me that I it was about the idea that that there's this irresponsibility I guess with the, with movies and the tropes that they present and and that's true and I and I think that one of the things that I I was adamant about you know with this film and also with my last film was that like it has to be done a certain way to retain the story and the reason why you see all these fucking tropes in movies all the time is because they cost so much money and you need so many producers and you need a studio and you need da, 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 all these things to finance your film but at this point in time you know you can you can finance with such a smaller it's such a smaller scope and what that enables you to do yeah the work is a million times harder and you have to wear fifty thousand hats or whatever but but you have control over the narrative mm -hmm. if i had ever tried to bother raising real studio funding for this film i never would have gotten it because they would never but you can't have the anti-war message wrapped up with the hero veteran thing it's all no. there's there's a there's a there's a way to do things in that world of film of movie making that just you know doesn't apply to the thing i was trying to do and so be, because we stayed small we were able to to keep all of this stuff intact um that's really what it 
it hinges on. There isn't somebody over, over my shoulder saying, you have to cut this out. You have to have them fall in love. You have to do these, this, that, and the other. And, you know, that's what it depends on. This for this demographic and do that for that demographic. And, Mm -hmm. and everything continually gets, gets watered down. And you said it, it retains no validity, no, no truth other than the, some of the universal truths of, of combat and, and, stories where people are put in, in horrible situations. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, the, about the, you know, the other vets being, being film buffs, you know, that it's, it's, we, we don't, we learn so much about military culture and about being in combat from those places. But what, one thing we, we don't do with TV, pretty much TV and movies in general, but especially um, war movies is attempt to separate the, the cinematic from the from the truthful you know is to really <laughs> dial down into what those are and and danny uh, danny mentions this often but i it's one of the few philosopher things i re- i actually retain so i i guess i can cram a little a little credit for remembering it but there's a a thing that a uh, quote from marcus aurelius that talks about finding the truth in something and about scrap scraping away all the layers is about you know pulling everything back and trying to find out what is really truthful what's really honest and um and i can see that you know everything that you've shared you know that the taking taking smaller steps in between shooting getting to know the veterans over a long period of time which you could tell that that you know you you seemed a little your character seemed a little uncomfortable meeting them but they were totally cool you know, they were like, Hey, please, you know, and, and some of that, I think there's, there's, we all have presumptions, you know, we're not, we're not exactly sure, but we know the look, we know the look on someone's face, you know, that, that, that trying to, trying to find a, a mental soft landing just once here and there, you know, a few friends to listen uh, um, and, and hopefully uh, some, some better support, you know, that the, and, and the movie, I, like I mentioned earlier, I think it did really well with that. I think it did really well blending both the, the family and the friend support to our veteran protagonists. I think they did a, re- a really good job, but they didn't make it about them. It wasn't about them. It was, but they were, you said it was a, it was an honest inclusion of, of what that would really look like in real life. Um, aside, <laughs> aside from going to Thanksgiving dinner with the full table and arguing with grandpa, you know, your, your, your war wasn't as hard as my war was boy. Um, um, but that, but, but yeah, no, so much of our, our expectations, I know my personal expectations when I joined the army were entirely shattered because I believed these different films and it had certainly taught me that, that, you know, war is awful that you're going to be put through things that you won't understand and you can't quite quantify to people. But, um, see, I had a point. <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, I have a similar like relationships to these war movies where like, you know, I would watch born on the 4th of July all the fucking time and apocalypse now. And I love this shit. And of course it's just horrifying, yeah. but it's, it's so intense. And you, it is you just, it is. It, even in its most in its its harshest depictions it's still and then the tim o'brien points at this all the time you know it's it's just it's scary to think that that's inspiring you to, to go do that it's 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 a crazy paradox but it's very understandable too it's it's such a it's such a human i don't know it's it's, it's part of human nature to to want to i don't know do something extreme and test oneself or you know i don't know but i, I definitely had that going on as a young person all the time you know um Funny, it's just this kind of slightly off topic, but you've reminded me of something <clears throat> in the process of making the film. I got more and more cognizant of the fact that like the structure of shooting a film is, you know, like the, the veterans would kind of comment on this and observe it as we were doing it, but like the term shooting the film and 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 the whole kind of structure of the day and what happens at what hour and who's doing what everybody has their task and their mission and i love that shit and it was and that was one of the things about film that was so grounding for me that i embraced so much you know i was i was really hardcore about it when i started i would like sleep four hours a night if, if i could if i could achieve that i i was working and studying around the clock and making films and i was really i was really into the rigidity of the roles of who does what and 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 i i clung to that and it really helped me sort of function for a while and i i think i embraced it to a fault but it's just funny that there's a lot of similarities between how a film set runs and the necessary hierarchy and, and all of that 
um, and, and, and military culture. There's, it's, there's a lot, you know, I, I wonder if I, if I thought through that a little bit more, I could come up with, you know, dozens of examples, but we definitely had a fun time during the shoot observing all of those things. It's, it's, it's you know, not a coincidence, you know, I think there's something to it. Anyway. Um, Sorry, that's a tangent. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, a friend of mine, um, I haven't talked to him in a number of years now, but I, I serve with him in Iraq and he talks, he had, I, I know it's a quote from somebody else, but about uh, the greatest game being man, that combat gives you a high you won't find pretty much anywhere else. I mean, and, 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 and it, it, it makes sense, you know, you, being near death, your adrenaline, your cortisol levels, everything that Im, Im, imparts that into you, but it also makes you, can make you an addict of sorts. And some of the movie tropes we're talking about feed right into that, that they, you know, that they show the good parts, ignore the bad parts, you know, not the, we, we don't, you don't see friendly fire very often in movies. Like I mentioned earlier, burn pits, we don't see, you know, in movies. Um, we also don't see taking um, criticism of, of political leaders in terms of the war taken to that far of a level as well, that it would be it, it almost probably by some people it would be considered anti-American. I consider it very uh, pro-American because it's honestly reflecting us. It's not trying to live up to the myth it's saying we need to decide what's myth and what's and what's fact um but but we don't we don't talk about that that even if you don't get trauma even if you don't have any of these other things happen that you can come back a person who i know for me where the volume of life is just turned down it, it is it's, it's you know that things that that might have previously been exciting really aren't aren't as exciting anymore and and it's it's hard to push yourself in that direction you know it's easy to dwell on the on the bad things but um uh yeah i i have i have a connection to that that i you know i don't talk about very much but it you know <clears throat> i don't mind mentioning it if it's relevant because i think it's something that um, ties together the, the combat experience in a very specific way that you're describing with, you know, the, the sexual trauma, because, um, you know, f one part of the trauma that I experienced was, was, was that in my life early on, and it, it involved, um, you know, an incestuous relationship. And the, and, the, and the fact of the matter was that there was a high that came with that because, you know, I was, yeah, I, I obviously not fully cognizant of the situation, but I, but I was to some degree and I, and I understood that this was a secret and this was special and this was these, you know, and you, and you get high on this thing that I'm doing some magical thing that no one's done before. And it's so it's like, and the problem was when it's over I many years later and you realize like relationships are boring, guys are boring, sex is boring, like all this shit. It's just, you cannot, you can't even like a person anymore because it's so dull yeah. it does not compare to the astronomical fucking high that you have in that sort of like so i don't it's obviously not the same thing that you're describing but there's an interesting i think connection there that that is maybe worth looking at for you know or just at least observing out loud because it's there you know it's it's such a part of the experience um, oh, i i uh you know I look, I look back on my time in the army much more differently now but um, that is one thing that I, I know I'll have, you know, for the, for the rest of my days, that it's, it, that there were moments that I, I did, I loved it. You know, I, 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 re I remember feeling both the fear, but the high of, of people trying to kill you. And it, you know, it really changes. I think it, 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 it changes your whole makeup and you have to kind of, um, you have to come up with a different system you know, something else, you know, in terms of, in terms of analyzing things, you know, in terms of, um, that, a you know, a, a relationship, you know, might've seemed fun, but for you, it's not, it, it may not be. And so you have to find, you know, acceptable to you metrics to feel, feel what that is. And like, for me, you know, in terms of excitement and do, doing ordinary things, I have to remind myself, okay, this could be fun. I actually could have fun 
doing this. It's, it's kind of worth it to get out of the house and, and do something. Um, but you do constantly have that, you know, that, that life turned down thing. And, uh, the thing is, is that things don't, don't shake you quite as much anymore. You know, that, that, that even big life events can have, uh, you know, that there don't, you don't react in the way that you thought you might. Um, yeah. yeah. And what, what fucking war movie puts that forward? You know, when, when do they show you that part, you know, mm -hmm. of Martin Sheen's experience in Apocalypse Now? I, mean, I fucking love that movie, but like, you don't get to see that fact. You know, you don't get to see him try to figure out how to deal with the fact that like he can't tune into life anymore and he can't even experience anything and in, in, anything emotionally or anything yeah. like your life d disintegrates. And, you you know, as much as you, you know, I, I, people don't talk about Taxi Driver as being a war film, but it is, you know. Absolutely. Travis Bickle's a Vietnam veteran. I mean, it's it's fascinating to see he's just so solitary and he's, you know, so you get to see some of the, mm -hmm. the inability to connect with other human beings that goes on. Um, of course, it's not explicitly political at all. Um, no, no. But I, I, I recently saw a taxi driver for the first time. The fact, that I, <laughs> the fact that I almost made it to 40 while not seeing it, I'm, I'm sad. I really am because I love Robert De Niro and, and it, it, uh, Aside from that and one other movie, I think that it, it, it did do a, a splendid job of showing how paranoia and mistrust feeds in. But the thing that I love the most about the movie was the um, that as he was about to become violent in a mm -hmm. way that wouldn't have been acceptable to the state, one little thing changed his his pattern. And he went and was violent against the right people. You know, we normal, you know, that we, when we get into, you know, being anti-war, we, we start thinking of almost everybody as being the wrong people to kill because either they're civilians and they had absolutely nothing to do with it, or they're people defending their country. And so, you know, you, you, you kind of come to a point where it's like, we went to their house and tried to knock down the door and this is what happened. We should accept and understand that reality, but we, but we don't. Um, but no, you expected, you expected in Taxi Driver, you thought that Travis was going to try to kill the Senator and everything lined up, everything was, you know, and then one little thing. And that's the thing that people miss is that veterans and well, human beings in, indeed, that if, if that happens, that it's going to explode where it explodes, we're not certain. And I don't mean every veteran is going to explode, but that person in that kind of temperament and isolating themselves, finding people or ideas as the enemy, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I thought they did a really good job with the, the, the paranoia part of that, the mistrust and the, um, and not sleeping. He talks about that so much. And I, I do okay with sleeping these days, but I have so many friends that either sleep in terribly small chunks or they really don't sleep at all. And, 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 and that it, it's a, it's a really hard way to live life, especially in combat when you, when you need to, to get some kind of sleep. Um, but the other one I wanted to mention real quick and, um, was, uh, from heaven and earth, Oliver Stone's third Vietnam movie that the portrayal, I can't think of the fellow, uh, Steve, the Marine Corps, the, the staff sergeant that ends up marrying, um, uh, I always, I mean, it's Lai Lee or Lee Lai. I always mix up the order of how you're supposed to say her name. But, um, but you see, you know, he comes home from Vietnam. He's very clearly drinking a whole lot, and then and then just a little bit later, he he kind of dials it back, and you see it. It just all kind of comes out, and that's the that's the needs to be held within our idea of war. Is that yeah? Some people might come home okay. They might come home, seem all right, happy to be at home. Three, four years later, it's, 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 and, and part of it, um, and it's something we haven't, we, we discussed a little bit, you mentioned it with, with working on a movie set is about the creation of family in the military, or in your case, being on, you know, you're with this, this group of people, some of them you maybe like, some of them you maybe don't like, some of them are just abhorrent to be around, but they're part of the, the net, they're part of your, your support net, and then one day, the end of the military comes and you've been through the, or, or if you change units, it can happen. You know, for somebody's in the army a long time, this process happens over and over again. You know, they will go on five deployments. That's five different sets of military family that went with them. And each time there, there's a loss. There's a, and, and I know that I felt it myself. Um, 
but we haven't, I don't think that we've even included that too, you know, to understand what that really does to people um, over, uh, over a long period of time. Yeah, no, there's loss there. It's law and, and you don't, it's not like you have time to contend with it, you know, time no. to digest it, <laughs> just file it away. And it just becomes part of who you are now, just more loss, you know, yep. never have time to grieve. And, and so much time might go by that you don't even know what you're grieving for. You may not even make the connection between that experience of loss and grief with that actual incident. You know, have, you know. Having um, uh, specific times of the year when certain mm -hmm. anniversaries of things come up and, even mm -hmm. if you're not thinking about it, you'll, you know, that a date will go by and be like, wow, that was such a fucking hard day. How did that? Oh, I totally forgot. But yeah. your insides, they don't forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 I, I don't know what calendar they're following, but they mm -hmm. don't forget you. You hang on to it. And, um, you know, yeah. and, and and it it's uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't have a second thought there. No, no, um, I, I, I think that it's like that. one of the things that helped me so much to start to deal with the trauma that I had was to understand it, just what it was doing in my body. It's like, to listen to what's fucking going on. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. and then I started to be able to cope, you know, but it really was like, my body knew more about it than I did. Certainly, you know, and, and just being able to like respect that and make the space for it and, sure, and sure, not try sure. to shut it down or sh put it away or, 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 tell it not to be there. I mean, shit, like self-loathing alone has taken just years out of my life. You know, just like, I shouldn't be going through this. I should be better. I should know what to do. I should, it's all that shit, you know, it doesn't but, banish but that, you. I mean, um, that, that goes back to our, 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 you know, our predefined ideas about trauma, you know, that mm -hmm. there, there are quick fixes that there are, you know, a, a couple, a couple pills and, a, and, a little bit of therapy and you'll be, you'll be good to go. And it's, it's not like that. And, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's just another, another thing we cling on to, you know, we want to cling on to the, uh, especially in America, you know, the, the hardened man, the hardened person, but, you know, don't need anybody to help me through the day or wh whatever it happens to be. And yeah, they're, they're dumb asses, but yeah. One of the things, one of the first things that uh, one of the veterans I was working with on the film pointed out to me, um, Dave Keefe, he was so angry about the fact that all of these movies with all these tropes that you and I have been just talking about, one of the things that's so irresponsible about them is that once you depict trauma as something that can be easily fixed like that, then it lets everything off the hook and it's okay to keep sending people yeah. <laughs> into that situation. It's fine because they'll be fine because they're going to come back and they're they'll suffer, but they'll be fine. And so the, and so the cycle can perpetuate. And when yeah. I thought about it that way, I was like, that's okay. Then, then it really solidified. Like that's one of the fucking found foundational, you know, premises of the movie premise of the movie, you know, has to be in there and can't be tampered with because it's, you know, that's, um, you know, it's something that, that movies don't take responsibility for, but that's going to look around at, at our culture of just, we're just awash in media of all, all manner of irresponsible stuff that we're being assaulted with on a daily basis. And it's all just so damaging, you know. I know the, um, you know, the, the film deals with, with moral injury in a, in a very serious, but I think a very um, fair way. And one thing that's interesting to me about um, about our system here is that the Department of Veterans Affairs acknowledges moral injury. They say moral injury is real, that it can really hamper people, that it is not just an element of PTSD or PTSD itself. But the Department of Defense does not acknowledge that. And so, you know, I, I've, I've in doing other research for uh, just learning about some of the different uh, things that happen are biology and in, in service. Um, what was it? What was I talking about? The, the moral injury thread. Moral injury. Um, um, that if an entire wing of our government, in fact, the biggest, most expensive wing continues to pretend that this thing that happens to Americans, you know, even if we're able to put aside all the harm that we do to people around the world, that between American troops coming back with moral injury of one, one kind or another. And then you also have um, people that are there, 
people that aren't troops, you know, civilians and contractors and stuff. And, and that's something that we don't acknowledge nearly enough is that when, you know, when contractors get killed or hurt, you know, that they have families, they have, you know, but, but they're in a separate column, you know, they're, they're not, they're not as valuable to us as soldiers that we can kind of wrap with the flag. And so it's easier, easier to send them. But, but like what you mentioned about just in the cycle, just, we're just going to keep pumping people out that there's deliberate, um, I think that there's there's deliberate ignorance on their part to not see you know with that things that scientists and doctors are studying you know like like the uh tiny concussions the guys can get from shooting machine guns i mean just just the impact of it is enough to give somebody a uh a tbi you know to actually give them a, a, a traumatic injury of that kind but we don't talk about that we don't talk about people breathing in burn pit fumes we don't talk about people um dying in accidents of a variety of kinds usually vehicular aircraft ones are especially ha happen with with quite a bit of frequency but we you know it's just accepted it's just oh well that's that's the sacrifice for a free nation you know and it or however they want to coin that um but we have to we have to force them to acknowledge the cost on us and that when we do that when we when we're when we're able to get something as big as DOD to acknowledge something like moral injury, then we're able to more say, hey, even if you don't care about the people over there, care about the people over here. If they're the ones that you're willing to wrap in the flag, then why aren't you protecting them? And, and, and they're willing to do all that fighting with the VA to make sure that we have benefits and things. But um, Dan Danny, my, my co-host, says it all the time. If you care about veterans, if you are supportive of veterans you want to thank veterans make fewer veterans send fewer of them overseas to do stupid missions and and you know does does anybody grow up uh wanting to become a sailor that dies in a massive collision of ships at sea because of incompetence and poor leadership do we, we don't talk about that in in uh in recruitment pamphlets that kind of stuff doesn't doesn't come out and all of this everything that's in this movie i think it's only fair that the people who join deserve to know it but you know it depends on a lot of life things you know culturally we all have different views on the military and sometimes you know the hardened guys are just like hey i don't care anyway anyways but um it's much harder to ignore the pain and suffering of your own people than it is people that you you feel have no agency and i I'm not, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not knocking the agency of, of lots of people around the world who have been victimized by military operations in one way or another. But um, that's where it's, I think that's where it starts for most people, where the anti-war type of yeah. thinking moves in is that, okay, well, this is, this is not the way the troops should come home. This is not, you know, how are they supposed to have their lives? How are, you know, we are on the podcast, we talk a lot about the, the tradition of the citizen soldier. How do you return to being a citizen carrying all that with you, you know? Our culture doesn't have that institution, right? To that, that kind of ritual of, of integration. No, no. At all, right? I mean, yeah, that's... Um, it, it's interesting. It's what you're describing made me kind of remember when I initially, years, you know, started writing this, I, I immediately what I gravitated towards was, was, you know, I would just kind of plant myself in the library and get a whole giant mountain of books, all that I could find that were personal accounts of people who, who were in the, in Iraq specifically. So I was thinking like, okay, is this, what is this? You know, this is, there's two conflicts right now. There's Afghanistan and Iraq. And I immediately went towards that one because to me, with my minimal understanding of what the fuck was going on there, that seemed to me objectively so wrong like okay that you going to afghanistan sort of made some sense after 9 11 kind of like I, I that whole period of time for me was disastrous but i understood like i was interested specifically in the experience of somebody who was engaged in, in that particular occupation because as a civilian that's what um it stood out to me as being like well how do you stomach the the look the wrongness of that right um uh you know and but I, I, yeah, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that was my, you know, because it just, because that invasion seemed so, you know, just fucked from the beginning. Like, it's just such a fucked idea, you know? Um, and, and, you know, to talk to, you know, f people who have even less of an understanding of the situation than I did thinking Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11, all this insanity, like such propagandist 
bullshit, you know, and, and, but at the time, you know, when it was happening, you of course couldn't say that you, there was, there was such a, a backlash against um, speaking out, but um, you know, over time it became possible to do. Um, but anyway, that was, I don't know how that, but it, I think that that's the moral injury thread. It was in the very beginning, it was my, my kind of, what is this thing? You know, it was, it was specifically about, um, that experience and, and suicidal ideation in relationship to that, you know. Uh, George W. Bush made a, I don't want to call it interesting, it was morbid and fucked up, but he, he made a choice in the very beginning of the Iraq War to forbid um, any filming of yeah. returning troops, of dead, of dead troops, and that was was a you know an incredibly powerful and moving image from the vietnam war was the sight of of the dead coming home and being you know and literally you can look in the in the shot and see however many coffins and so you know in in line with the, the idea of dod just completely disavowing it that someone made you know made the very conscious choice to remove that from our ability to have a discussion and then you also have newscasters who some of them I think are, are doing a, a, a little bit better on, on the critical parts of it. Um, but that, you know, Walter Cronkite was the guy that started saying it on the air every single night. This is the, however many, many number 122nd day that we've been in Vietnam and this is what's going on and um, really hammer that home. And we don't, we don't see any kind of that mm -hmm. journalistic courage anymore. Um, in that way, but but going back to, to to Bush's choice is that there are people who firmly understand this, who firmly understand how messed up troops can come home, um, and you know their their propensity for violence. You know, I don't think, I mean, percentage wise, it's you know not a lot of veterans I think are are overtly violent, but I think a lot of them are can be very close to that line. You know that, that we see what happened with the, what happened at, uh, in the Capitol on this on January sixth, um, but I also think those guys are looking for meaning. They're looking for that return to the military family, the the cinematic, the the you know the production family. They're looking for a, a meaning because they they felt that they had a great amount in the service, and they're they're trying to return to it. And you can't I can't blame them, but the reality is is they don't even comprehend that these, these things are happening. They don't comprehend what they've been robbed of. And they're still putting their trust into, you know, U.S. foreign policy writ large, which is just absolutely asinine. But we don't talk about it. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't want to give people a pass for being so ignorant. But at the same time, if ignorance is a staple of your culture, as it kind of is for being an American, you know, we, we can't wear, have people wearing COVID masks. Our freedom is at stake. Um, that it, uh, you know, it really, it really changes the calculus. Um, and I hope that that can change. I hope that over time, you know, I, I, the other day I saw Jake Tapper on CNN talking quite honestly about Yemen. You know, I don't know how many times he's done that in all the years he's been a journalist. I know there's been other times where I was like, nah, that's full of shit, man. But, um, you know, yeah. I, th I think we, we have to get over that hump of, you know, we it's kind of like Trump and knowing that the more you hear the lie, the more the lie sinks in. And I think it's the same with with military culture and with those those kind of tropes. Um, tell you, I think that is a, a great place for us to wrap it up for today. Um, will you uh, remind the listeners again about the festival this weekend and uh, share with them anything else you have uh, coming up? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so this is not a war story. Um, you can watch it on Sunday, March 28th. Um, I think it should be playing for, for 24 hours that day and possibly into Monday, but there'll be a QA and a uh, with myself and veteran Eli Wright and actor Sam Adegoke and executive producer Rosario Dawson. Um, so I think you can find that just at cinequest.org. Um, it's just you Google Cinequest and this is not a war story and it'll come up. Um, yeah, and for other news about the film, you can just, you know, keep tabs on either me, I guess, on, I'm not I'm totally social media illiterate, but I'll occasionally post something about where the film is at, if there's something to say, um, or uh, the company, my company's website, which is acousticpictures.org. Um, yeah. um, do you, I mean, th this may be way, way too early, but do you have any thoughts as to what your next project might be? 
Well, yes, <laughs> um, I've been writing um, for a while in this quarantine. Um, uh, I've been writing a lot, but I, 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 it's kind of, yeah, too early to talk about what, what it is. That's um, okay. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely kind of gunning to make another film, hopefully sooner. I have, I, I take a, a bit of time. To, to yeah, no, I, I imagine it's definitely time for a vacation of some kind. <laughs> especially with especially with covid you get two vacations two vacations one for the movie one for covid yeah it's been it's been a good year well talia thank you again for uh joining us today and uh thanks thanks listeners for uh being with us here and we will uh catch you all again next time well thank you henry thanks for having me yep take care talia